Ladies and gentlemen, we are the Art School Rejects, and Rejects. On today's show, we have special guests, Chad, whoop, whoop. Baptiste, also, of course, we have Carlos, what's up, everybody, and myself, which is Shane Prescott. So, on today's episode, we're going to be going into the outer depths and possibly finding where Chad lies. In Chad's science corner. And also, we're going to talk about some other stuff. And if we definitely for sure have time, get into Mr. Robot. Mr. Robot. Mr. Robot. At the end. So if you haven't seen it, then you can skip that part. Because <laughs> we're going to be talking yeah, about spoilers. Sure. Spoilers oh, alert. Oh, hell of a lot. So, uh, Chad. What's up, guys? What's up? Long time. Yeah, man. Yeah. Welcome back. Feels good to be back. Welcome back to the pod show. Yeah, Chad's a resident, so uh, he's a resident art school reject. We had to get you back because there is so much science news. Now, nah, for real, though, it feels feels good to be back. Uh, feels even better to jump back in during this extremely heavy season of science this year, I must say. There's so much shit going down out there in the science community that I feel uh, elated to share some of that information with you guys. And it's pretty dope. Calls to us. We do not destroy ourselves. We will one day venture to the stars. A still more glorious dawn awaits, not a sunrise, but a galaxy rose. A morning filled. That's awesome. For sure. All right. Um. I think the best thing for us to get a start off on is probably what will ultimately become uh, the hottest discovery within our lifetime. But I presume at least within that's what the you next said last time. hundred years. Uh, that's true. Uh, <laughs> every every, every discovery, <laughs> every discovery comes out like Chad's like, "Yo, this is gonna be the discovery of a lifetime, gentlemen." It's it's weird though because it's like that's how it always is. New science discovery, top of last year, <laughs> last year September's discovery. Now, what's, what's dope about this one, as compared to my last science corner, talking about the projected uh, ninth planet way outside in the Oort Cloud, uh, this one is real, or I should say there is a tangible amount, I should say tangible amount of ed- evidence that points towards its existence. And we are, of course, talking about Proxima b, mm. a terrestrial Earth-like planet that um, revolves around our closest celestial neighbor, Alpha Centauri. That is fucking amazing. Yo, is that like the same planet that Ty Lib and, and Most Death were talking about? The new moon rolled high in the crown of the metropolis, shining like who on top of this? People were tussling, arguing and bustling. Gangsters of God thumb, hardcore hustling. I'm wrestling with words and ideas. My ears is prick, seeking what will transmit the scribes and apply to transcript. Yeah, I think so. You know how I know about Alpha Centauri? It is like totally, it's awesome. totally random. But uh, the game, uh, have you ever played Civilization on the PC? No, I've never heard All that. All right, one. well, there's a game called Civilization. It's very popular. It's on the PC. <laughs> <laughs> you just start off as like you're like a like a caveman or something, <laughs> and then you like start farming your land and then all of a sudden like you get fire and then like you get the wheel you just like go through all the stages slowly but surely, slowly but surely nice. and you like you can like conquer other like continents or whatever you can like all of a sudden you have like a legion of like armies and then you're a roman legionnaire and then you can like invade eventually anyways you get up to like modern times and you can build like cities and modern cities and and then it does space exploration and civilization. If you go know. all the way to the end, this is like a PC game that I played in like I think I was like sixteen years old. Or like something. Like that. That's dope. And then like at the end, at the very this is like the so spoilers if you haven't played Civilization <laughs> from like nineteen ninety seven. Um, 
you can go to another planet or to another what? yeah you can like do space exploration and then like the the space station or whatever that's out there that like the last the last step of the game is called alpha centauri oh that's awesome that's very cool i need to port that for my for my tablet yeah PC. it's out there still should be <laughs> oh i dig it yeah but no it's, alpha centauri is a is a pretty dope system and for us being able to discover a planet there it'll be the first extra solar planet that is very possible for us to explore within our lifetime how far away is this planet from here to Boca. to an extent because it's only 4.2 light years away from us. oh that's it that is that that in itself goes beyond neighborly like that's literally wait 4.2 light years yeah so that is traveling at the speed of light it'll take you but four only years takes four years to get there so of course you know by conventional rockets is it? the fastest is... rocket we have yeah. it'll take us thirteen thousand years to get thirteen thousand okay so, so how long do we live you know that's out <laughs> 13 ta- what Thirteen thousand. Yeah. One three with three zeros behind it so of course and we'll get into this a little later but we have other means that we could use to send um you know shout out to Stephen hawking and this other bloke for the star shots um rocket system mm-hmm. where they just kind of send wafer size processors using solar sails being powered by lasers shot from earth that get it to one fourth the speed of light and you can actually get it there within 20 years what no that is a that is a very feasible wait 20 like human years 20 human years yeah <laughs> 20 dog years so you just imagine it like this like it's literally like a, a cheese it size computer uh-huh. attached to a very large solar sail pushed by lasers from earth to about a fifth the speed of light and it can get to alpha centauri in 20 years this is theoretical though no it's 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 very possible it's not, it's it's not theoretical bitch. at all that's science okay <laughs> science the shit out of it yes yeah, so, but i mean i i guess it is theoretical in the fact that it uh, it doesn't exist yet but it is a it is a very tangible sure means of transport but yeah you know so that's that's definitely so what can what so there's possible life there that's a that's a big thing that's a little bit of so so the this um, this a reach this this is a exoplanet that is as close to its star as we are to our star correct to an extent yes because the um proxima b as where it gets its name from orbits Proxima Centauri, which, if you guys were not aware, um, Alpha Centauri is actually a trinary star system. So it's two binary stars, which is Alpha Centauri A and B, mm-hmm. and then a third red dwarf, which is Proxima B, which is Proxima Centauri. Mm-hmm. And all three kind of orbit a very eccentric system. So this is like a it's a solar itself. it's a solar system with three with three suns with three suns. Okay, yeah. So it's pretty much is always sunny in Alpha Centauri. <laughs> in Alpha Centauri, yeah. All right. Uh, in Proxima it's B, it's always sunny. <laughs> it's like Tatooine, right? You can see like there's like two suns in the in the background or whatever. Pretty much. If you're on Proxima, uh, Proxima Centauri itself would be your main source of light, but Alpha Centauri would be like a sun. very luminous. Yeah, there will like, be like two full moons constantly yeah. in your in your night sky. With with that said, Proxima Centauri itself, of course, is a red dwarf, so it's a much smaller solar mass sun than compared to our own, even though it is relatively close. Proxima B itself is relatively close to Proxima Centauri. Um, its size grants a much larger um, Goldilocks zone. And mm-hmm. this planet that we discovered or that evidence suggests orbits within it. That means like um, it's just right for, for supporting life. Yeah. It's not too cold. It's not too hot. The porridge not is... Not too hot, yeah. But there are a couple of clinches, though, that I really I need to stress um, regarding the possibilities of life on it. You know, what's good is that with all of this information that we have, we know for a fact that if it's, it's the, about the same size of Earth, it might be a little bit heavier. It's in the star's Goldilocks zone. So it's in a range where, like you said, Los, it's not too hot, it's not too cold. Liquid water can possibly exist on the surface. But I, was, I took part in a Reddit, uh, Ask Me Anything, where the scientists who made the discovery of the planet took part in. And they decided to, you know, drop some knowledge on us regarding the whole, hey, is there a possibility of life? Because obviously that was like the, that was like the big question from everybody, you know what I'm saying? So what they said is the planet more than likely is tidally locked to Proxima Centauri. And that is like Mercury to the sun. So one side of the planet is always facing 
towards the star. And that is bad mm -hmm. for life. Mm -hmm. um, because they're, well, with, without an or, or without a axial rotation. One side of the planet might have it. Right. Without an axial rotation, there's no way to generate seasons and, you know, just divert the energy, mm -hmm. the solar energy. So not one side's always getting cooked and one side's always fucking frozen. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? No four so, season hotels on this planet. No, nah, not yet. Maybe later. With that said, they were they did some diagrams based on the heat signature of the star where the habitable zone on the planet itself is like a donut. And this is the crazy shit right here. Cause it's like if you're at the pole, like if you're at the at the, the not the pole, excuse me, if you're at the equator of the planet looking dead at the star, it might be too hot or too irradiated from the sun. But if you just move in any any direction towards the poles, you get to that really, really comfortable, balmy, 70 degrees, mm. you know, t a constant temperature. Keep in mind, it's tidally locked, so it's not like a day and night thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> but that means, like, you have to move to, like, to Iowa. Feet. Iowa. So everything in the north, in the northeast, central north and northwest is like the best place to live. You know, it would literally be like Portland or New York or Maine. It's kind of like how it is in America. Yeah. But if you go beyond that towards the poles and towards the other side of the planet, then it gets much colder. Florida and, <laughs> Florida and like Canada. <laughs> That's it. Um, this gets to like Canada, Trans-Siberia, Russia, throughout the rest of the other side of the planet. So those are like big you know there's a good chance there is no life on this planet at all because of these little things but you know it's still interesting so but besides the fact. it may be something that we can actually set up shop in get some freedom going on over there <laughs> drop some freedom bombs <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that the four light years is very very attractive for scientists because we all we really need is to rethink our means of getting there and we could get there with no problem at all, without jump drives or light speed drives or any of that BS, you know. So it's it's pretty wild, man. That's it's cool. pretty fucking crazy. That's mm -hmm. cool. That's cool. I'm 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 excited. I'm ready to start, you know, making my vacation plans. No yeah. doubt. Proxima B. Proxima B is where it's set at. Set up. Man. We'll probably get there before we can get to Cuba. <laughs> no, dog, we just had our first commercial flight. Like, yeah, I know. We we, 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 we there. We there already. <laughs> we beat it. We there already. We there already. <laughs> we got to Cuba. I'm right. I'm right. Ready to eat some uh, tostones. There you go. What? And some bustelo. Oh wait, that's that like coffee. Yeah, some Cuban coffee. Proxima be pour over, bro. Mm. I'm I'm fucking I'm trademarking that shit right now. Yo, <laughs> that's yeah, the legit thing about space travel. Like you guys have to realize. Like I had a friend who just recently moved out to uh, Washington and from Florida, and like he complains about how there's no Cuban coffee up there yeah you guys realize that once we really do start space traveling like we're gonna be really far away from this sort of coffee cuba yeah really far from cuba yeah. well that's that's called a mis industry bro you're gonna have to be the guy that makes yeah. it you know what I'm saying? so we're gonna have to have cubans in space i mean they i probably they probably have like a secret space program in cahoots with us yeah for the last 60 years <laughs> Putting, yeah. putting Cubans on the moon. Nobody yeah, knows. Nobody knew that. They're on the, they're on the dark, <laughs> dark side of the moon. <laughs> yep. We don't know. That's There's a probably point. a Cuban flag right now on the moon. Yo, that will be the best. I, I want that. Legitly, I want that to happen. Like, we go back and we were like live HD broadcast, 4K special, and we look over and there's a freaking Cuban flag yeah. on the moon. It would be the best thing ever. Yeah. Be like the ultimate, like, fuck you, America. Means <laughs> communist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so. Cool, man. Well, I'm excited. Yeah, that's that's a, that's big news. That's big news. Uh, on, just to touch on another thing, dude. You guys got to keep in mind, bro. It's like within our within our lifetime, something really fucking massive is about to go down. Like we're gonna see some shit that's gonna change science for the rest of our lives, and it's gonna happen with us while we're still alive. That to me is the most like yeah. tantalizing aspect about all of this, you know. Like if we find this ninth planet, which would be fucking sick, if we can actually do the star shot thing and send 
these wafer sized computers to Proxima, you know, get pictures and explore an extrasolar planetary system. Like that to me is fucking that's wild. I'll be alive to see this shit. And then there's Mars. You know? I mean which, Elon's trying things. to get to Mars. Yeah. I mean they had they had a setback. Yeah, they had a setback, yeah, had a setback yeah. last week. I think that was uh more than a setback. I think that I wanted I really think it was Hank. Oh, you think that's some saboteurs saboteurs? Yeah. Yeah, because from what So it's I've right now it's SpaceX and there's also what virgin galaxy or something uh, oh yeah NASA. virgin NASA. galactic yeah nasa still doing sh- rockets <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah there well actually um nasa's rocket system that's going to premiere in the next couple of years is going to be the next um it's it's the successor to the space shuttle program mm-hmm. and they're going back to the apollo um saturn rocket system where it's just a one solid booster rocket with the module on top and this shit's supposed to be what's going to send NASA astronauts to Mars. What, but that's what not is take what is SpaceX? Next, like, what are they they because they they're doing about yeah there's it's pretty much the same thing. It's like one solid rooster yeah. bo- um, bo- rocket, but their clincher is that their rocket is reusable. Mm-hmm. Hence the whole launch, send the module into space, reland the rocket, use it again. And despite the fact that they just lost what was it like a hundred million no like seven hundred million dollars on that explosion. That's, that's, that's like that's like on. one that's one blemish on an extremely successful entrepreneurial rocket development system. This is unprecedented. The guy's lost one rocket in the last two years that he's been doing this. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? NASA, for all intents and purposes, they've been in the business for like sixty years, but I mean, they've lost a considerable amount of government lives funded, privately funded. privately funded. Yeah, there's well, no one died yet, so well, it's all good. That's that's good. NASA, yeah. you're looking kind of shabby right now. Nah, man. Nah, no, no, NASA. Come Mars. on, NASA's OG, man. NASA's doing it. Nah, no. I need some. They they put people in space. Yeah, Second man. people put people in space. They put people in space, not satellites. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to NASA. Shout out to Elon for doing this thing. For sure, man. Yeah. For real. I just watched him in a documentary, actually. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, what it was Warner Herzog's uh, documentary about Ooh, the internet. Who's this guy? Warner Herzog. It's called Lo and Behold because the very first message transmitted over the internet was L-O. Hey, we got porn. <laughs> Pornhub.com. <laughs> was uh, L-O? Yeah, L-O. Well, th- it was scientists down in UC, U- USC, right? The University of Southern California. And they were sending messages to another university in Stanford here in the Bay Area. Right now. And they were trying to send a login message. Uh, but they typed in L-O. And as soon as they went to type in the G, the internet crashed. <laughs> this is the very oh, first this is the very first message ever sent. Yeah, so the, the G... It was L-O-L. <laughs> almost. <laughs> the G didn't make it. So really the first message that ever got transmitted over the... This is in like 1966. Yeah. The first message that got transmitted over the internet was just L-O, low. So, lo and behold. That's awesome. And that's the name of the documentary. So, it's it was, it was really, it really good. It goes from the very beginning of the, the early internet. So, you get stories from guys that were there, like, you know, OGs that were there in the 60s. Um, and it just goes through, the, you know, the 80s and how people were talking about the internet in the 80s. Uh, which is hilarious now if you listen to like news stories from from the 80s like talking about this new wave called the internet like i was watching it with saiyan and saiyan <laughs> who's he's never known a, he's never known like a world minus the internet mm-hmm. so i'm old enough that i can you know i didn't always have the internet growing up no, no doubt it was i think most of our to- listeners can what concur <laughs> But he is saying is like he's born in 2002, so he's he, we always had the internet. He, it was really crazy for him to watch it because he's like, wow, it's weird that like people are talking about the internet like it's this fucking like this like it's like Brand this new. like dragon living in the hillside. Like, right. <laughs> it's so normal for him. We're, it's only we're available and, and on it's like, college campuses and, and in like, the military. And <laughs> what was crazy for saying was that like this isn't that long ago for him. It seems like a thing that's always been around for years and years and years. You know, yeah. it just seems like that. Um, so it's, it's a cool documentary. And one of the things that they talk about is also artificial intelligence. And there's a really interesting part where they're talking about basically like the consequences of developing 
a a conscious artificial intelligence. Now, do we, we know like Elon Musk and some other people have been kind of weary on the fact that if we we might do something, <laughs> they might do something to us. <laughs> yeah, we might do something and they might do something back. Uh, but there's basically a guy, um, Stuart Russell. I don't know if you guys ever heard of him. Nope. Mm. I only know Bill Russell, Kurt Russell. No Stuart Russells. Okay, Stuart Russell. He's a, a, a science professor and artificial intelligence pioneer, uh, and he kind of wrote a letter basically saying that like it's important that we don't try to limit the abilities of artificial intelligence because uh, the threat of it becoming conscious and like becoming like an evil. It's just like we don't even know, understand what consciousness is. So why are we, tr- we why are we trying to like stop it from you know from gaining right. from gaining this thing? It's like everything that's ever been created in the civilization has all come from the human mind, and we've never tried to magnify the human mind through a tool like artificial, like something that could just rapidly take all of our thoughts and ideas and magnify it to a degree where we could possibly end world hunger or house like the entire population or stop you know all of these things that we can possibly achieve through artificial right. intelligence that the threat of it just becoming like malevolent and trying to harm us is just like it's so out there because we don't even know what the fuck consciousness is right what would constitute a consciousness artif- artificially or otherwise and something that we create you know what i'm saying rather rather than like you said a device that can exponentially develop the things that we need as a society you know we're all so afraid of this like made-up boogeyman mm-hmm. of something we ourselves don't even understand yet mm-hmm. yeah i think that's that's pretty fucking poignant but the thing is is that here's here's the kicker though it's not that it's gonna develop a consciousness and like try become like try to attack us or whatever but it's the un- unintended consequences of our programming so once right. artificial intelligence starts making decisions for us then we have to really start watching out because this is this is the this is from the movie this is the um the example that actually elon musk made himself uh he was saying that like you can program an ai to handle your hedge fund and you can tell it i need you to control my hedge fund and start making all the best decisions with my money in order for me to get more money you know for for my investments to grow so you leave your AI in charge of your your stocks or whatever, right? And what the AI does is it figures out the best way for you for it to multiply that money for you. And the best way that it can think of is it like invest all its money in defense contractors. Mm-hmm. Missiles Damn. and like Chills. rockets. <laughs> and then it and then it does like it, through the back door, it does like it starts a, a war. You know, it's like it Up, yeah. starts a war and said so that all of a sudden your stocks go way up because it invested right. in defense. So that is like something you didn't even think about before. And it just did that. Not because it's like evil or whatever. It's just because like that was the. It was. Yeah. It's the most pragmatic approach to that. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's fucking nuts. Ironically enough, we do that already as humans. So <laughs> you guys seen the movie Wally, right? No. <laughs> of course man come on that's a perfect example of that ai the ai that was on the ship because he wasn't bad he just did everything to keep humans alive and it meant listening to that final protocol of not going back home even if anything you know pretty wild you can see that happening Pretty freaking wild, man. AI is that is that scary thing that we obviously we don't know. Because I mean, as you as you clearly said, it's at the end of the day we don't understand ourselves how we even think. So to trust in something else that wouldn't make a wrong decision, but just might make a decision which is best, but ultimately be our demise. Yeah, just, that's one thing just, I was thinking. Like, you know, it's like. The first thing that came to my mind when you were starting off was um, the machines like, oh, how do you end world hunger? How do you bring about like all this stuff? Get rid of the people. <laughs> and no one's hungry. You know, I'm like, OK, yeah, yeah. that makes sense. That's, yeah. that's not where our thought process was, well, but it makes yeah. sense, though. <laughs> well, the, the, the way that programmers have always programmed uh, programs, I guess, um, is that you just give it like a long list of 
things not to do. Like don't yeah. like so okay, so like the example that they give in the, the movie is um self driving cars. So that's a big thing now. Okay. Right. So oh I think U- Uber and Lyft, I think they're both like getting on board with self driving cars. Yeah, I think, and um Uber did that recently in Philadelphia. I believe that's where Carnegie Mellon is in Pennsylvania or it's like in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania actually is um mm-hmm. this university that's on, on the forefront of artificial intelligence. Um, so they're experimenting with those self-driving cars right now, and I think in Pittsburgh. Um, but probably within the next year or two, they're going to be popping up in San Francisco, and New York City, and all these Major places. Cities. One of the examples that they were saying was that if you have self-driving cars, they're number one. There's actually a guy on, in the movie that is like the leader in self-driving cars nice. research. And he's, he's saying that like, in the movie, it actually shows you what the car sees. Like it shoots out like an infrared beam everywhere. So it sees like in 3D, like according to like infrared oh. beam. It's, it's pretty wild. It's pretty wild. But the guy is saying that the, the number one rule is don't hit anybody. <laughs> yeah. And the number two rule is don't hit anything else. <laughs> like <the> other <laughs> and then the, <laughs> so Don't hit people and don't hit like don't crash into like other things. Uh, yeah. Number one rule trumps number two rule. So if you if like if you have to hit something, like hit a thing instead of a person, not a person. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> um, so that is like the two rules. And according to like the way that programmers have been programming things right now, you just give an AI like a list of things not to do. But what the AI does is that it kind of will find like we were saying earlier, like a loophole to get around those rules that you give it in order to accomplish its goal right so a thing that a self-driving car might do is like oh in order to get my passenger from from a to b fastest maybe what i'll do is i'll just reroute all of the (laughs) stoplights you know (laughs) like it'll go through the the, in the grid and just start rerouting all the stoplights so it only gets green lights all the way there so then all of a sudden this creates like other problems right because this ai is like you didn't tell it not to do that You know, so like it doesn't know like that it can't do that. So this is like not a really good way of programming our AI is like just giving it a list of things, a list of commands. Right. And that's kind of how we've always done it before. So we're going to have to think of like a new way of doing it. It's just I guess it's just a matter of rationalization. How do you program rationale and a thought or an execution process for an AI? You know what I mean? Is this kind of like, will, will it by that point? generate its own quote-unquote thought process on how best to execute a specific command or its duty without us intervening you know what I'm saying like the like your example where it's just like i need to get this passenger from a to b there's so many stoplights along the way if they're all green i get there faster mm-hmm. boop they're all green now and i've gotten <laughs> you know so i don't know how do you how do you properly or propagate I mean, I rationale guess one into way thought process? that you can could do that is to one solution I just thought of, it's, let's say it's a Shane, great... Shane is about to solve the, the, the problem. Let's do it. <laughs> no, We're no, going to no, send no. this podcast straight to Oh, my it. God, I'm about to make a billion dollars, bro. Watch. But no, it's like, what I'm thinking is you have a grid, let's say a 20-block grid, and for that 20 blocks, all the cars that run within that one um, block are controlled by one single AI. So that it's... So that AI just works on that 20 blocks. You go over to the next 20 blocks... It's a totally different AI. So they, they don't talk to each other. They don't know they exist. They just know that this 20 block radius is their life and that's all it is. So I think in that sense, you know, you're, you won't really have something which is super duper competing with like, you know, outside of its radius. It's just working itself. So it's not going to try to like, oh, well, I need to get this guy here faster and need to get this guy here faster. So, uh. It's going to calculate the fastest route to get everything moving optimally, I think, will probably be the best solution in that case. I don't know. What do you guys think of that? Yeah. that could. I mean, they had a, they had a, they had a, a theory. Okay. What's their theory? Like, they, like, the, you know, the dudes at Carnegie Mellon, like, the, like the, yeah. you know, the, the professors at, at uh, this research institute. Right. And that is, like, in order, instead of, first of all, I like that idea. They had they they actually had a um, robots playing soccer. Oh, you're about in to the, take that idea. <laughs> go make 
<laughs> uh, I'm about to just write a paper right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yo, Facebook that. They shit. had a um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, one scientist start like writing like important research papers and posting it on Facebook. I'm I'm done. Yeah. It's over. No, I meant more so like fake like how the Facebook movie started. Uh, one guy just ran with the other guy's idea. Oh, okay. Anyway, oh, you you talking about Zuckerberging it? Yeah, Zuckerberg. Zuck, Zuckerberging your idea. Don't yeah. get Winklevoss, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, continue. What are you saying? They had they actually had robots playing soccer. These little these little tiny soccer playing robots. They're thinking and and learning on their own. Once like one robot learns something, it never has to learn it again. And not only that, but like every robot that comes after it never has to learn it. Like, they, you know, like once one robot makes a mistake anywhere in the world, then like no other robot in the world would ever make that same mistake because it, right. it just like they're all connected. Right. So this is yeah. pretty interesting. But um, the idea that these guys were talking about is like instead of programming a long list of actions or commands for the AI not to not to do, don't kill people, don't hit people, don't and so on and so forth then um uh, is better way is to observe humans and learn from just observing humans so watching people do actions and then kind of learning from just watching other people do it real people you have racist ass robots well that's the other problem like, everybody's different so i guess it would come down to having some sort of uniform generalization of human behavioral patterns Rather than it being so individualistic, it's just kind of like, here's common sense shit that most people would more than likely do. And just observe these, look for these specific patterns in humans and observe it and how they, how they respond to it. And that would be a good way for an AI to grow, I guess. No, but I mean, like, okay, just thinking about it, my brain's thinking is, you're going to, it's pretty much like raising a kid in Laguna Beach. They grow up in a bubble life they only know so much what you know their parents can afford for them like whatever is really within that microcosm then they step outside into the world and let's say if you had to take one of those kids and you took them to i'll just use like oakland little haiti you know little haiti or like not even say a battery just some place those places aren't bad by the way just some place like outside of their ecosystem you know they don't know how to act you know like they're like trying to get certain things done buying food and like just how everything is so different for them they they can't like work within that so that's what i'm really trying to point out is that if you were to have these robots these ais like pretty much just bred in this uh like uh, what, what are we talking about um like behavioral patterns yeah or best exposure. humans like yeah these are the best humans to like be exposed to it's still gonna run into problems there's when, a there's of course there's a lot of moral ambiguity with that process because then it's like who is determining what is the viable normal human experience for this ai to learn from but it's not to gonna counter be, your point it's kind of like it's gonna be easy yeah exactly that like what but what would be another option if you had one chain his idea, he's got the 20, the 20 those, car grid. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, but exactly. You, but, but you see how that kind of works out then is that the robot works only within that area. And but then it it's, it's less of an AI. Yeah. Now it's just a, it's like no, an no, app. it's still an AI, but it only works within that area. So if that AI were to be placed 20 grids away, it should be like, whoa, what the fuck is going on here? Like, I have mm. no clue, mm -hmm. mm. you know? But now rethinking about what you said earlier about how with robots, if something, it learns something once, mm -hmm. then it kind of knows, then maybe, maybe that might be the best approach is to have them work in small areas, learn that area, and then connect to each other so then it, ultimately learns that okay in section a this is what happens section b this is what happens okay i can see section a and b i know exactly what happens in that in those two sections section c this happens differently okay section a and b and c like i know that stuff so it's not like trying to put what it learned from section b into section a 
I mean, that's a pretty good point because then at that point, let's bring it down to a more tangible observation. So it's like a, a like a two three year period where these incremental grids are ra- at random in- implemented into that twenty block grid area. At the end of those couple of years, now all of that information gets integrated, and now you have this phenomenal amount of data on traffic conditions across like two different cities. And like you then propagate that information to other places and it's like, here's all the shit that you can do, road development, street width, lane number, parking, all of this information now gets gathered into even like just the resident, residential, like what goes on there? Is it a lot of housing? Is it a lot of schools? Is it a lot of shops and shit? All of these factors now that this AI could just propagate into one system is like, here's everything that could be done to make this the most you know, efficient source of transport, not even just for self-driving cars, but for just anything. And then now, now that data just gets implemented everywhere. And then where these new data gets on um, place, it takes, as you said, it just runs into whatever um, scenarios that it didn't encounter in those previous information uh, data grids, update that shit. And then it's like, boom, here's a new list of how to fix this area. And you now, we go broader, you take it out of the traffic, you know, traffic control. And it's like, how, what can we do systematically for our cities, for our states, for our nation? That's the goal right for there. For exploration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's right. the goal right there. And so then Shane shit, I think, you, I think you've just it. solved. <laughs> <laughs> I think Shane just solved the uh, AI propagation problem. This, this, is, this is what, uh, what Stuart Russell says as, when it comes to the AI's systems. Uh, is a, an AI system can be designed to learn from humans in this way. It should ensure that they remain under human control when they develop capabilities that exceed our own. In addition, to, in addition to watching humans directly using cameras and other sensors, robots can learn about us by reading history books, legal documents, novels, newspaper stories, as well as by watching videos and movies. They can start to build up an understanding of human values. It won't be easy for machines. People are irrational, inconsistent, weak-willed, computationally limited, <laughs> heterogeneous, and sometimes downright evil. Oh, nice. Like you could be you could be conscious on your execution, but you want that massive development. You know, you don't want to restrict it to one aspect of its growth. You just want it to incrementally grow at a yeah. pace that you yourself can control. And right, we're just going to gloss over that thunder just now. The other the other problem with this is that the more that Excuse like we develop these technologies it's you know we're talking about uber is doing self-driving cars now so what's going to happen to all these uber drivers mcdonald's is putting robots in their fast food restaurants flipping robots, robots flipping burgers. <laughs> flipping you know what, flipping I, burgers. As, I, I, I hate to interject you know so rudely but i have absolutely no qualms with jobs like that being removed from the human growth pool well here's let let this now be the standpoint to where people can be fully utilized to their fullest potential and they're not limited by either social socioeconomic or racial you know adversity to keep them from recognizing a potential as a human being and now then adapt that information to something else so now instead of having an entire community of people be fucking uh, burger king servers no these people have gone to school they're fucking scientists they're environmentalists you know, they they are now attributing to an aspect of mankind that can make us grow as a species rather than fucking serving us shit food. Yes, let the robots take that shit over. Yo, but how you know do we... I'm, I, I stand for that. Okay. Fuck yeah. I agree. All I hear <laughs> is Chad saying, yo, fuck that $15 minimum wage. <laughs> fuck I said you no guys. such thing. Flipping I said no burger. such thing. I am wearing my <laughs> no, Jimmy John's shirt I'm, right I'm, now. I'm just kidding with you. I'm just kidding with you. That, that's just that's, that. that's exactly... Chad, you're absolutely right. But how are no, we no going doubt. to pay our bills? That's the question. So that's the interesting thing that some people have been coming up with is a right. universal basic income. Communist. That is going to be not crazy because this is something that um, Switzerland recently has voted down a monthly base income. And right. there's a, a organization called Y Com- Combinator, which is a tech company. Mm-hmm here in the Bay Area. They instituted a program here in Oakland, actually, uh, of doing a minimum income pilot program. The guy uh, from um, Zipcar, Robin Chase, 
he says, uh, for the last hundred years, we've been chasing productivity. Suddenly, these productivity improvements come without labor. So it's not clear at all these productivity gains will result in the everyday person having a better life. If they don't have a job, they don't have a better life. And he says, automation is a job killer. That's no secret. A basic income can keep automation from destroying the economy and the entire way of human life. Which is respected. But then it goes back to my point where it's just kind of like, at what point do then these, let's keep it to like a very low income societal mindset. You know, what is to keep these people, if they were given or even had a better opportunity at growth, that their income doesn't have to come from working at these kind of jobs. Their income then comes in from the shit that they're, you know, that they're being attributed to, that they're contributing to in itself. You know, well, I'm not is, saying that, that they become yeah. scientists and they work for free. You know, that's a, a, that becomes their job now. Well, what we're going to be maybe I'm being to, a little gonna, bit. We're going to be free know. to do is be more creative, write, write yeah. plays and write music and paint. Imagine. Yeah, imagine. Exactly. And not 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 necessarily isn't something that's going to be able. We're not going to be able to really sustain ourselves just doing that. So what they're saying is that we will just give everybody money every month. Right. Here is like your base, your basic income that you can use that to support yourself. And then in your free time, you can add to society by contributing with all of these creative endeavors. Right. And because like, you know, companies like Uber and all these, you know, they're, they're making so much money by automate. First of all, like once Uber doesn't have to pay drivers, <laughs> like it is a wrap. That's, you know? that's a, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, that's 100 percent that, profit. profit. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, all the revenue, they're, they're actually losing money right now because they have to like all of these new laws started popping up for Uber where they have to treat their drivers fairly. <laughs> <laughs> where they, they, right. you know they yeah. weren't they weren't before now everybody's like man you got to treat these people like like employees but not nah, for sure once they do that that's, that's definitely a wrap but they're going to be making all this money they can give some of that money back and contribute to just maintaining like civilization like the, like you know the, like the, the basic economy like you know like a way absolutely of, a, our, our normal way of living so essentially we're doomed for a Wally lifestyle <laughs> where we all sit down in a comfortable ass chair, we're all fat and we just play Facebook games. I mean, if you want to live, if we, if if we stay the you, course right now, well, if that's what, I mean, that's absolutely. also a decision that you have, like, you know, and but I'm, I'm saying like, even if I didn't have it, if, if I didn't have to get up every day, you know, and do, you know, whatever, but like, I was still, I was still run. I was still do my, my nightly jogs around Lake Merritt. Yeah. I was still, you know, right. go to gym or gosh, still, do all these things because that's that's a, if you if you you can take that route huh. but that's so a, that's a decision it'd be kind of i just got like this one idea will we just really become pets <laughs> yes <laughs> no i'm serious like we don't have to strive really to do much of anything we've made a system that is maintaining our well-being at an optimum efficiency level that we don't have to like you know worry like about food or yeah. some disease or i'm just talking like way out there that's a utopia you know but well i'm a utopia society mm -hmm. but i'm saying like this is and exactly what that's what we're i see happening well that's the goal so, but then the 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 flip side of a utopia is a what uh, dystopia uh, Dystopia. Dystopia. Okay. Okay. I was right. I was leaving that up to you guys, but and that is the that is the fear. So if if we kill each other, if we kill the environment, which we're you know probably was was probably going to happen anyway. So we you don't have to worry about that utopia thing because we're we're already right. But but getting back to that, the why I want to make that thing is we'll just be pets. Like yeah, that ain't we'll bad. just that ain't run bad. around in a a garden <laughs> and have as much sex and whatever and just be like hey i want to go for a run hey i want to go Wait, for a swim do whatever hey, do whatever you want man. no yeah. but you're, you're forgetting what this opportunity provides for us as a species as a whole mm -hmm. now this gives us the opportunity for everyone to collectively participate in growth like no exactly extra, extra growth this is like mm -hmm. hey you know what the next chapter for our species is this this is all that we can do as individuals to get us there right but i guess what i'm forgetting to say is that mass majority of us 
would get to that point where like shit i don't gotta do this i can just fucking run around and fuck but then that's like that's a com- that's a comparative argument to something that exists right now if i guess over time this becomes a normalcy we won't be asking that question anymore you know what i mean like we'll just be we would just it would just be what it is and we'll be asking what comes next what comes after this you know because it's very easy to ask a comparative uh question if it's you come from something that didn't exist anymore because it's like oh shit this this place is great i don't have to fucking pay mm-hmm. bills i got da, 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 da. That's a good this, point, fucking this is running around fuck yeah you know but yeah but down the line like saying is the fucking perfect example this you know born into a system that he only knows. He doesn't need to ask a question. Fuck, what happens if I don't have any? Mm-hmm. Fortunately enough, he lives in an environment where he doesn't have to ask that question. So all he has to do is focus on how to better himself as an individual and people around him. You know, whereas we, being where, where we're from. Generation. Technically, generationally, we have that luxury. Brooklyn. Brooklyn, New York City. To, to make that comparison. But then, you know, down the road, that can legitimately just be what is the best thing for us as a whole. As these systems are helping streamline our existence, our impact on this, on society, our impact on the planet, it now reverses, if not outright eliminates, our degradation of life in general on ourselves and our planet. You know what I'm saying? So we just. I'm I'm a hardcore optimist on this whole thing, so I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's good. That's good. But I'm just saying, like, the conversation just leads me to think that we're just gonna go back to being. And when I said pets, we just go back to being primal in the sense that there's so much everything's done for us that all we have to do is just go to the place to eat, run around. Sure, we can still have an imagination, but we would probably just get to a point where we don't really need to worry about that after a couple of generations of us are born into the system that just provides for us. Can I tell you a secret? It's been three days since I slept. I'm up to about 200 milligrams now, but that's not the secret. He's gone. You heard me? He's gone. Going from AI and talking about self-driving cars and all of these robots to talking about our favorite TV show now. Yeah, yeah. Of course, Mr. Robot. Mr. fucking Robot. Sam Ismail. One of the most brilliant creators out there. Fucking a. Control is an illusion, guys. Oh, my God. So we're going to be talking about Mr. Robot. If you're not already caught up on the show, then just, well, no. that's it. Yeah. <laughs> just press mute. Just mute it. Uh, uh, it's just spoilers alert just so you guys know spoiler it alert be, i mean we're talking they, about we're in season two right season now, two right? and yeah. we're not this is yeah it's still midway through the the season or not midway we're past the midpoint but we're getting towards the the finale yeah what do you guys think i remember we talked a little bit about it like at some point i think we talked about season one a little bit last year uh, but i haven't talked to you guys about the season two so all the stuff that's been happening my my thing is i was talking to a, co- a co-worker about this i i've had a little bit of like a, a meh with the writing this season so far mm. where it's like i could definitely understand that they're building to something mm-hmm. but it's being done in such a way is that i'm getting bored <laughs> okay so that's kind of <laughs> you know, a, like it, that that is a critique that's a lot of people have been having about the season that's yeah kind of a slow burn like the um the the twist with Elliot being in prison mm-hmm. and a lot of the opening with his routine was all in his mind. That was that was solid. Sure as hell didn't fucking see that coming. Yeah. Okay. But I'm like, it took way too long to extrapolate that I with all the that. shit that I need to get answered from season one alone. <laughs> uh-huh. There's still so you many know? questions from season one. You're, you, so many. Yeah. And they're asked and they're presenting so much more in this season. Uh-huh. And I'm like, what the fuck? I'm still like I've I've only just at episode seven learned what happened when the door opened was him going to prison i'm just kind of like uh-huh. come on man there's like what's that, up what's up that what's was the finale on? from season one that was like, yeah. it, season one ended with a knock on the door and then in wonder. this season just in i guess it was episode seven you're saying we found out that it's actually the cops and he got arrested for hacking his therapist's like boy okay tinder date. date yeah <laughs> <laughs> actually no he got arrested for dog napping yeah 
That was a flipper. That was a charges. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking flipper, yo. He took flipper, and that guy was a dick. He was. He was. It was. It was completely deserved what got what Elliot did to him. But I mean, shit. He got got. He got got. And he like he didn't want to lawyer up. He was like, just give give me the years. And and what's sick though? Because like he got sentenced to eighteen months for. Um, you know that like where he dog. you know that where he sees the judge like through a camera. Yeah, like he's not. That's actually a real thing. No, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it's like crazy. what's interesting yeah. is that he didn't he didn't serve the entire 18 months after i guess whatever went down when he took down the warden which was fucking cool that i guess um, right. white rose stepped in and dark army i got his time reduced his sentence reduced mm-hmm. which is fucking crazy yeah so he ended up doing like i think like three months or something like that yeah at most uh-huh you know? because the dark army still needed elliot to to for them to move forward with stage two of the, stage two, of the, which is of his the fucking plan, which is oh. his plan. Uh huh. But that, that, that's Dude, that's that. where we're getting kind of you know that's that's right up until like what talking about yeah. stage two. But like, if we kind of look at season two as a whole, I kind of like I like the slow burn. I kind of like these new tidbits. Yeah. Since Elliot has been at a commission, yeah, we got to spend some more time with Trenton, Everybody Mobley, yeah. Darlene, I miss Trent. Angela. She's so cool. Trenton's badass, man. What do you mean you miss her? Yes, she is. She's not. She ain't going nowhere. <laughs> She's still around. Well, <laughs> we yeah. don't know. Yeah. Not but Trenton's dope. A lot of questions, yeah. man. Like the Dark Army. Yeah. So my big thing is Philip Price. So that mm-hmm. is, he's the CEO of e- e- Evil Corp. And he doesn't know who White Rose is. So White Rose, like the relationship between Philip Price and White Rose is where all of my questions kind of everything else is pretty straightforward like the uh, like elliot being in jail the whole time like that was actually a, a pretty popular fan theory that actually yeah. came true i yeah, i learned that after the fact people actually thought that he was i had no yeah like idea. once like somebody because i somebody actually thought that up like really early in season two and as soon mm-hmm. as like that kind of seed got planted i was like i saw i started seeing it everywhere you know, like the yeah. fact that like I, th- I think I told Shane, like the fact that all the basketball players just were wearing like old Navy, like basics, <laughs> like it yeah. was just like really weird to me. Like the whole thing didn't seem real. It didn't seem like a real place, like a like. Like reality, like when I go to yeah. basketball, court, I play a lot of pickup basketball. I've never seen anybody. I've never seen a whole court full of basketball players that just had like solids. on. <laughs> like like right. it, it was just weird. It didn't seem like real. And it turns out that it wasn't, you know, it was actually in Elliot's mind for the most part. That stuff is pretty straightforward to me. Um, it's just what does Philip Price have invested in the five nine hack? I think is my question. Mm. What does he stand to gain? Because he didn't get the bailout, which was he was no. he was pissed about. But what is it? Why would he want? Why would he why would he be involved? And like, dude, like, first of all, I think it's crazy that F Society, like our band of like fuck friendly hackers they think that they're doing some shit but they're they're just pawns in this fucking exactly right in this like bigger bigger conspiracy they think they think they're the revolutionaries of this whole thing and they're just like participants exactly of the world's hand i feel i feel it has to do with the fact that all of a sudden now ecoin is the Mm -hmm. largest Mm -hmm. or will soon to be the largest source of currency globally Uh right now and i'm wondering if that was what is price's ultimatum so you like you see it like when dom the agent when she goes to like yeah. the sandwich shop she like you can see in the background uh of the bodega that they have like we accept ecoin yeah and we accept bitcoin so mm-hmm. it is like there here and there like you see these little tidbits like oh you know put your money in ecoin because credit cards aren't working anymore and this is right. like the fallout from the five nine hack like it's crazy because i was listening to one of the writers talk about this season and he was saying that like they actually talked to like all the experts on the economy and like what would actually happen if like the biggest bank in the world suffered a hack like this like what would be the fallout and they kept it as accurate as possible so we're kind of seeing like you know it didn't turn into like mad max like immediately yeah but it's slowly <laughs> you know there. but like if you go to a restaurant you gotta like you gotta pay with, you gotta prepay you gotta pay in advance mm-hmm. and then you also see like uh, Mobley and, and Trenton, uh, how they they're kind of like, well, we we thought that we were going to help everybody. It looks like we're we people, made a terrible we made, mistake. Yeah, like people are suffering. Like the people that we wanted to help are not getting anywhere. 
And they're yeah. kind of right, right? Because the White Rose is is really, or the Dark Army is really holding all of the cards. Well, I mean, are they though? Because it's like, I, I'm assuming it was White Rose talking with the guy who went to go see Elliot at the library, indicating that how, like, why, why did Elliot want to see us? And what do you mean he was asking about stage two? It's his plan. And it's making me feel that Mr. Robot has had his hand in some shit way deeper than it was initially given. You know okay. what I'm saying? Well, Elliot actually, if you remember back to episode, I think it was the second episode or the third episode of this season. I can't. Re- I don't really know the episodes because like the first episode was like two episodes or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, like, it was mad long. Yeah, it was like it was dope. Yeah, like the first episode counted as two, I think. And then the second week was like episode three or I don't know. But it was that scene where Elliot first puts on the, the gentleman mask. Uh huh. And like Darlene comes over and she's wearing the gentleman mask and she's like, happy Halloween or some shit like that. And like yeah. he put Elliot puts on the mask and he starts like going into this like Ram- like rambling. Yeah, yeah, rambling where he's like, oh, we can just hack this company. And then like. Oh, the fallout will be great. But then like the initial fallout is just the beginning. Like that's when we have to hit them the hardest, right? When they're like mm-hmm. the most vulnerable. Right. And so he's actually talking about stage two in that monologue. Yeah. And I guess what stage two is, is just like to hit him again. What is different? What we don't know is like what the hack is or what the stage, right. what that hit by hitting them again. What does he mean? And I, and I, and it makes me feel that the dark army is like ready. Mm-hmm. You know, they're they're waiting for the go for this stage two. And at that point, exactly now, I feel there are three edifices that are taking part in this whole thing. You have Price and E Corp, White Rose and the Dark Army, Elliot and Mr. Robot. Mm-hmm. And it's like Elliot and Miss, Mr. Robot and the Dark Army are closely or more closer coinciding with each other. But White Rose can very well have his or her, certainly her own agenda outside of the Dark Army with whatever shit she has going on with Price. Yeah. If they've all had their hand in the five nine hat, you know, what let's let's theorize what could be the ultimate outcome for a company in this kind of atmosphere. Well you know what I mean? Okay. Shane? I'm 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 listening. Okay. <laughs> I'm listening in. So E Cor, Evil Corp is involved with finance and they're also involved with energy yeah so if you take out the financial system and then you also take out the energy grid what would that look like as far as a society goes stone age stone age so we know that white rose was really really cared about the washington township plant yeah which is a nuclear power plant which is the original nuclear power plant that killed Edward Alderson, yeah, and yeah. and Angela's mom as well, and I don't know, you know, like dude, this I don't know, man. It just sounds, it just seems so fucking nuts to me. What would, what does the Dark Army stand to gain from a complete apocalypse? <laughs> right? And maybe the, and maybe those, like and, a you know a complete global reshuffling of superpowers, or you know, a force like you you force the people with power. To now rethink and reapproach the distribution of wealth and power amongst the people. I'm being completely idealistic, dude. I have no fucking idea. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're 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 you know we're just throwing stuff out there. Yeah, I mean this is this is this is why the show is so great because because Sam Esmail he keeps everything so close to the hip. You know he doesn't yes, let man. you know so nobody really really nobody knows. I mean people can kind of come up with their own theories, but yeah, man, we haven't even talked about like the whole. Mr. Robot Elliot relationship. <laughs> yep. Mr. Robot's fucking off having all these conversations with these individuals by himself. And Elliot is comp- either he's either catching the tail end of it well, or has a new well, He blacks out. And yeah. then he waits. Or so, brownouts. Well, brownouts. that's a new thing. Yeah. <laughs> that's weird because there was actually brownouts in, on the show. Like, yeah. As like, it was happening. It, as That's it was why happening. This guy is so fucking brilliant. So there's like <laughs> so the power so in New York City, instead of like going full blackout, in order to prevent that from happening, they kind of siphon just a little bit of power in order to create a brownout, which is kind of like where just all the power dims momentarily and then it comes back. So in order to yeah. avoid a full blackout, you just have this series of brownouts. 
And while that's happening, normally Elliot, when he turns into Mr. Robot, he blacks out. But yeah. now he's not blacking out. He's actually watching himself and Mr. Robot at the same that time. That's so nuts. So dude. what does that mean? Oh my god. Because he's in order in order to like because if he goes full so like the power grid in or if he goes full blackout then he blacks out but this time yeah he's just kind of stifling it a little bit in order to create a brownout situation where he's not completely blacked out he's still somewhat cog- cognizant. But what would what would contribute to him being able to regain control like that? You know, the biggest event of his life would be going to prison. Who or what could have? Could it alter just the, the shift in power yeah. like that? To well, where I he think could be making slightly conscious as Mr. Robot's doing his thing. Well, making like re- reconnecting with with his dad, like when he was in trouble in there, and Mr. Robot kind of was there for him, and they kind of yeah. made, they made a you know amends. Kind of that might have something to do with it. Very true. Yeah, because remember, like I remember that episode where it was like that '90s show, whatever. How mm-hmm. which I fucking loved, loved to death. That's when Mr. Robot put Elliot in that position to be like, listen, yeah, trust me. And he was like, you know what? I'll trust you. I'll let you trust. I'll go ahead for it. And like, I know this like throughout the sprinkles of the show, like even Elliot was like, you know, like, all right, I tr- I'll, I'll let you drive every now and then. But, you know, I'm still doing it. But now I think I think Mr. Robot's just push trying to push Elliot out. And that's what we're seeing. And like, what's up with Darlene also? Like, what's going on in her head? I think she's just fucking up. I think she's, what I see oh, is that she's I've suffering heard. from uh, all the pressures of actually going through and... Pretty much running the show running while Elliot was fucking... Uh, while Elliot was in Well, she was the and, boss. You know, that's what I'm saying. So she had to make all those decisions and she just had to run it. And that's what we saw her do that and then and i thought she did it very well i mean she yeah it's just mishaps happen like what the tape the tape the the lady you know it's like all these things like these incremental slip-ups that are like causing people's lives essentially yeah okay you know but i no, thought she it, did a good job no she is like when maybe she i'm was, just you're in love i uh i got <laughs> hearts in my <laughs> eyes love. right now i think yeah, in butterflies or anything. I can't see her faults. She can't do wrong. If you all right, so you ever play that game Fuck Mary Kill? Yeah. Oh shit. Are you guys ready? We yeah. playing that game right now. <laughs> okay. Tyrell. No. <laughs> hey, hey. You gotta put some of those guys in. Alright. Someone's gotta <laughs> die. <laughs> Angela, Joanna, Darlene. F M K. What about Dom? I yeah, I mean uh, there was only room for three. I know. <laughs> I think Carlos is because Darlene Dom just came in season. Yeah, season two. Yeah. All right. Well, you go first, Los. Who, who oh man, who are you marrying? It's your game. I'm gonna say, all right, Mayor. Uh, yeah. I mean, I I can't I can't play this because I like them all so much. Well, one one of them's gotta die. One you, of them you started get it, fought, bro. And one of them you better one follow of them through. Gonna get married. All right, I'm gonna say Mary, Darlene, make love. I'll say Joanna. Harder, harder. <laughs> she seems like, like she, yeah, she seems pretty wild. A lot of fun. Yeah, so I, like that would be interesting. Yeah, that'd be a learning. That'll be a learning curve for me. <laughs> I mean, I think we would all learn something. She's on expert there. level. And then, I, I mean, Angela, I'm sorry, but I love Angela, but yeah. it's just like I can only choose, I guess, two options. So sorry. Although I do really love her speech that she gave. Um, that guy. That one guy. Yeah, at the, at the club. At the club. She was like, I'm like 27 and I'm like a fucking big shot already. You're just a scrub. Peace. Peace. Yeah. That was kind of cold. I guess like for that, for since she she kind of she kind of did that dude dirty, and also like she like she dissed on uh, homeboy. They the went, black guy. They, yeah, they went out for that date. Whoa. That was messed up, man. Yeah. You go out on a date and then <laughs> she like dropped them for like old buddy, this old dude. Yeah. Hey, maybe the whole <laughs> dealing with Mister Price. That's the guy's name that he yeah, that she talks to. Yeah. Maybe she likes the you know she got the taste of. What a real man's about, you know. He's got that grace, got that she, power. She didn't get with Price though. She probably didn't, but 
You know, you don't need to get with someone. I think she she just really likes all guys. Yeah. (laughs) What about you, Shane? All right. To be very safe in this world, I would marry Darlene because she's Mr. Robot's sister. So I'm pretty sure that she's going to be protected. And she's a really brilliant hacker, too. Yeah. She's a black hat level hacker. You want to be on that good side when shit goes down. I'll probably have sex with uh, Angela. Just cause, actually, no, that's probably bad. Actually, fuck, because didn't didn't Mr. Robot and Angela have something going on? Yeah, they were kind of like when he does have like that kind of that dream where everybody oh the euphoric every, dream, yeah, everybody that he wronged like in the past. Oh, like buddy when, from the plant. That shit oh, was so dope. You talking about Bill Harper? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So Bill Harper, if you don't remember, Harper, if you don't remember Shane, like is the dude nah, that he just eviscerated at this, the um the blue oh the blue God. steel or blue mountain facility. He just like annihilated this guy, made him like made him he cry, made him like up. standing up. It was fucked up. It was a public. fucked up movie. It was like, probably the most fucked up thing that he's ever done. <laughs> Wait, Terrell did or no, no Elliot. Elliot Elliot just ruined like just, ruined this oh dude's God. entire life. Think about it, Bill. Think about what. If you died, would anyone care? Would they really care? Yeah, maybe they'd cry for a day. But let's be honest, no one would give a shit. They wouldn't. And he didn't, he was innocent as fuck. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> the guy to get the keys, right? Yeah, yeah, the old, the, yeah that, that geezer. But, yo, Bill Harper, man, you didn't deserve that. But in that dream that he has... He kind of where he kind of goes back and kind of makes amends with everybody that he kind of did dirty. He and Angela, it seemed like they were like they ended up together in that. I thought maybe I thought that was interesting. Like there is something there between them. You know what? I'm just going to go with what I think. I'm going to straight up. I would marry uh, like Terrell's wife. Joanna. Just because. She's ruthless. She She's ruthless and she seems sick, like especially because she told the guy like, listen, I love you so much because you would never be able to give me. <laughs> Like, yo, what I that had. was next level, and bro. And I was just like, yo, yeah. okay. <laughs> you know what? At least, at least with that girl, like, you know your expectations. You yeah. don't need to, like, yeah, no. go anywhere. That's awesome. Just keep, just keep choking her out. And you're good. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's a real tough one, man. I'm sorry. This is really tough. But I'll just say marry her. Who, who would I have sex with? I, I, God. I guess Darlene. Mm-hmm. And then. Angela. Kill Angela. She doesn't piss me off in the show, but like, nah, it's not, she's not my type. Okay, Chad, I'm on Los Estes 100. percent Okay, marry Darlene, fuck Terrell's wife, kill Angela. There you go. No questions. Damn, asked. Angela. In every scenario, Angela dies. And Angela dies. The only exception I would make is what's, what's her face was still alive in the first season. The first girl. Yeah. Oh, uh, I would marry her. Elliot's um like his first flame drug buddy. Yeah. Yo, Chad. Dude, Chad has was... a soft spot. You saw that ass. And you're like, nah, but that hey. the way she, oh, the way they took her out, that hurt me so hard, man. That was such a tough episode to get through. Uh, such a good show, though. That's an amazing show. Ah, it, it's a beautiful show. It's 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 very well written, and I like to think it's um it's good TV. It has that like '90s good TV feel. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, it, it's just like a good show. In the '90s, like all shows were procedural, so like there would be like, this week, Elliot has to solve this case. It's like, oh, it's a child pornographer, and so like he has to like get this guy, in, and at the end, like the guy gets locked up. And then next week, there's like a new guy that Elliot has to like he has to hack and then get him. It's like that's how it would have been in the '90s. And this show is it kind of like like the first episode. You might have thought it would be kind of like that, but then. It's nothing like that. <laughs> they flipped the script on you like, yeah. in the first 20 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So it is, it's like, Hard. to me, it, it doesn't seem like a, a 90s show because that, that would show. be kind of like Law and Order or something like that. No, I guess when I really say 90s, it's just that feeling that I get. I feel comfortable watching it and I'm actually in the show instead yeah, like, of like I'm looking. super excited for it to come Looking for like shit. plot points like, oh, okay, like this is going to happen next. Like, like, no, every time something like every minute that I'm watching to me is like I'm on the edge of my seat, like just waiting. I'm never yep. like yep. guessing. Wholeheartedly guessing, concur. Like, like, oh, Wholeheartedly this is going to happen. Concur. So mm. I guess that's what, it, that's what it is for me. 
it's the only show that does that for me at this point. Um, I mean, Leftovers does that too, but which I need to I see, and I heard it was it. dope. You no, know, we told you about it, Hopefully. and like. On the podcast, season lesson. three hurries, hurry ups and comes out. I mean, there's some good stuff coming out soon. Um, uh, Hot and Catch Fire just started back up. Oh, shit, that's true. I never oh, watched I about that episode of that. I mean, uh, I know, I know, Chad, you're on board with Hot and Catch Fire, so hardcore. I need to see. No, I saw season two, I saw season two, so I just gotta. Uh, you um, saw, so you're 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 down with Mutiny now, yeah. I'm down. <laughs> what's, what's that show about? We talked about this already in the podcast. Um, no, it's, it's a hacker show, like, it's not a hacker show, no. It really isn't. There's though. hacking, but it's not about that. So it's kind of like a soft version of Mr. Robot? No. Mm-mm. With people like, yeah, so we're going to hack today, but uh, we're going to learn something. No, it's it's way. it's about the early, it's like the early companies in Silicon Valley. Like the early, like, like the, the, the dawn of the desktop age. So yeah. it's kind of like Silicon Valley on HBO, but not funny. Well, it's in, it's but the like, beginning of it. So it's like Silicon oh. Valley takes place in like modern times, and this is like back when Steve Wozniak and and or is that his name? Wozniak. Wozniak and Jobs. They're like in the garage, like tinkering, like trying to figure out like how to make the first. Well, no, they they did that already. They did so that like, already, but that was like the yeah. first season, I would say. Yeah, that was the first season. Exactly. Uh, and like this is that time, like right right when like people so it's were a period put... show. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. it's like Stranger Things. So, yeah, exactly. Which I haven't seen yet, but I heard it's good. Um, watch it the end of season one of Hulk catch fire there was an amazing scene where they were at an, an expo for computers mm-hmm. and there was this one room that had the apple II yeah premiered and they they were able to illustrate what that must have felt like being there in that era and seeing a fucking graphical in um user interface for the first time gui ever. bro they made you they made you stop and look at this fucking look bemo cube looking shit just everyone was just in awe and you were there just like holy shit can you imagine being there 1982 with apple II dropped no one in the world has seen it yet but you and all these other cohorts in a hotel room and it's like fuck. it's a very good show very, i would go there show. and be like yo there's no wi-fi you can't <laughs> pick this shit up there was the internet though there was internet i just Werner herzog told me that there was internet <laughs> lo and behold all done through telephone. Fifty six k. I don't even think it was, it was that. Like, high. Not even that. High, yeah, <laughs> I it love was like six k. No one had desktop pics. No desktops. JPEGs weren't invented yet. Yeah. Uh, so watch Hot and Catch Fire. Chad, catch up, and then once the season gets going a little bit more, then maybe we can come back and talk about that. Sounds dope. Sounds dope. So we covered a lot today, man. Today was good. A lot of science, a lot of technology. Mm-hmm. This would be a good podcast for everyone to. Take a little bit of something out of. That's what we try to do. Yeah. yeah. So, would you guys like for E Corp, I mean, for a Mr. Robot thing to happen? Oh, okay. How about this? So, since um, you brought up this whole fuck, marry, kill scenario. Yeah. Let's just that think was my about bad. It. <laughs> <laughs> I started something there. You, you made us choose. <laughs> so, and, and what I'm saying is, we have three scenarios here. Which one would you like to live in? The Mr. Robot scenario, one with the AI, or the one when we get to some Afro, like some other place, Mars. <laughs> you rather so it's space travel answer. is the best one for you. I mean, that's the only one that's gonna ensure if anything happens to our planet, then we gotta back up. And shit's happening to our, it. Shit can't happen to our planet anytime. A solar flare could just wipe out the internet tomorrow. And we wouldn't even have a fucking clue. No, we would know. You, we would go on there and be like, yo, can't check my Facebook. <laughs> but now nah, I get what you're saying. So space travel for you. How about you, Chad? I actually wouldn't mind living in a Mr. Robot universe. I'm going to be honest with you. There's, there's something tantalizing about us. A group of rebels, for lack of a better term, starting something the likes of our generation that is equivalent to what the civil rights movement was was the 60s this is like this a global restructuring of power and something about that just rubs me the right way and i like the idea of being debt free so, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know living on a 35 dollar a day spending limit seems harsh yeah. you know opportunities start to dwindle. on the show it's a 50 dollar limit 50 dollar limit excuse me 50 dollar you know but then it's like you got to get that wicker messaging app son I got that shit. Is it is it, is it any good? 
It was good, man. You give your text messages self destruct. I don't know how true that is. Is bro, that's what they that's what they use. That's what Mobley uses to to, to text Trenton on the show. Yeah, it's a real thing. But all of the stuff that you see on Mister Robot is real shit. Like the femtocell, that's a real hack. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, if I could choose one, I would choose the middle one. Robots just make everything awesome for us, and mm-hmm. we're just maintained. You don't like talking to your Lyft driver. No, 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 I'm saying we get, <laughs> you, you're, I, yeah. no, actually, <laughs> legitly, I, you'd rather it just be like Asimo up, up there, like, <laughs> driving you no, around, well, what's the name of that message app again, Wicker, Wicker, well, mm-hmm. my thing is, I'll just point out, yes, I talk to my Lyft driver, I am actually the person who normally sits up front and have a conversation with my Lyft driver, but what I was really getting at is to back to that scenario where everything is just automated and run for us. I would like to live there because I think at some point as the generations go by and we forget that we're being controlled, it would be nice to be that person who wakes up and realizes that we're being controlled and want to break out of it. All right, on that note. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wanted. Thanks, Shane. Um, you got it. Anarchy. Yeah, and let's thank everybody. So, sure. um, uh, real talk. want to do a quick shout out to Some Jerk and Single Flow for allowing us to use Rockley wow. Mans by uh, Skinny Hendrix. want to say thank you, Chad, for dropping in on the show. No doubt. Thank you all for having me. It's a pleasure. And obviously, thank you, Carlos. And not to thank me, but, you know, whatever. Thank you, Shane. We're all here trying to do this. Hey, thanks. <laughs> I tried. I reeled that one out of you. But, uh, yeah, to check us out, we're on SoundCloud forward slash Art School Rejects. Also, iTunes. we have a new. It's really yeah, important. It's really important to subscribe on iTunes. And if you could also write a review, nobody's ever done that. Yo, be the first. Be that first person to write that first review. Yeah. We'll send you some stickers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll do that. Keep your eyes to the skies, folks. There's mm-hmm. a lot of science going on out there. Big future in store for us. Also meteors. Nice. Yeah. Take us out. Thank you guys so much. You might have Talk to you guys later. Peace Adios. out, everybody. Get home safe. The sky calls to us. We do not destroy ourselves. 